Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome. My name is Elizabeth Sackler, and I had a great time this morning when I walked out the door and was able to walk out the door and saw the sun shine. It's, it's been a while. It's been sort of like I understand living in Seattle, which um, is a whole other thing. Uh, welcome uh, this evening uh, to our part three of States of Denial, the Illegal Incarceration of Children, Women, and People of Color. Parts one and two of our series, if you were here, was Sentenced to Change with Piper Kerman and also Mass Incarceration's Impact on Black and Latino Women and Children with Sophia Elijah. And they can be found, if you weren't able to join us, um, they can be found online if you put in brooklynmuseum.org slash E-A-S-C-F-A, Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art, slash video. Uh, you will be able to see those two earlier parts. And there are hundreds of other uh, great programmings that we've done at the Sackler Center available there too. So I'm happy to welcome you um, tonight to the Cantor Auditorium and um, this evening's screening of the documentary film, Crime After Crime which will be followed with a, conversa with a conversation, by a conversation, uh, with the starring attorney who has joined us from the West Coast, uh, Joshua Safran, and his co-counsel, Nadia Costa, was unable to be here due to a family emergency, and um, I'd like to extend my uh, thanks to her for all that she has done with Joshua and tell her that she is missed here this evening. And then we will have a book signing Joshua's new book, and uh, there'll be an opportunity then on stage for one-on-one -on -one conversation and questions with uh, Joshua. Last summer, I met Ann Tucker. Uh, I had really the good fortune to meet Ann Tucker, who is the founder of the Avoda Dance Ensemble, and she came into my life in a kind of an extraordinary way. She had a 30-year career with Avoda, which she founded, and she added a jewel, I'd like to say, into their crown. Uh, she started dance residencies and workshops for York Institu Correctional Institution up in Niantic, Connecticut. And it's the only state uh, women's prison in Connecticut. It is a maximum and minimum security prison there. My first visit to York was with her, was with Joanne, and it was last fall. And I have since then continued to do art workshops with the 10 inmates. Um, and I'd like tonight to thank Joe Lee, who is not here. Uh, he's a librarian specialist, and he's dedicated, and he's remarkable, and it wouldn't have been possible without him. And the reason that this is so important is because of the content. My first workshop there included a PowerPoint of the dinner party by Judy Chicago, which is up at the Sackler Center um, permanently. And I focused attention on five plates and followed that with an art studio session for the 10 women who had enrolled for the workshop. And using paper plates and acrylic paints and collage materials and colored pencils, they created their own dinner party inspired plates. And their focus, which was very uh, intense and wonderful, morphed into delight and then to an inmate's suggestion to produce an entire table complete with the runners and the goblets and the silverware and the heritage floor that you see uh, on the dinner party. And it is their dinner party, and they have titled their work Shared Dining. Shared Dining is what a mess hall or cafeteria is called in prison. The plates that they made represent women, whether mythic or real, historic or contemporary, who have inspired each of them, each of these 10 women, and these are their plate names. Feminine Energy, Eve, the Virgin Mary, Juliet, Shakespeare's Juliet, Lena, who is a great aunt, Phyllis Porter, who is a victim of one of the artists, 
Princess Diana Rainey, who was one of their moms, Danica Patrick, race car driver, Malala, as in I am Malala. The following didactic was written by the artists, the inmates, and it reads as follows. Inspired by the dinner party and the women in it, we were moved to honor the women who have touched our lives. Our plates represent their strength, struggles, courage, and achievements. These women are models of who we aspire to be. Though our materials are meager, we have not been limited by the lack of resources. Our imagination, resourcefulness, and creativity allowed us to turn commonplace objects into art. And it is signed, The Women of York. I am returning this Monday uh, to put the finishing touches on the piece with them, because on May 22nd, um, the Connecticut's Prison Arts Program annual exhibition opens at the University of Hartford. And it will open with shared dining, installed and on view to the public. It will be one of 18 Connecticut prisons represented in the show. And uh, I have watched art as a healer, and I have watched the transformation of one idea turn into an enormous and beautiful project uh, for great, of great pride for the women who worked on it. And indeed, it will be also up at the penitentiary so that everybody there, all of the inmates, all thousand, I think there are 1,200 total, um, will be able to see it. And since 1978, the prison art classes have taught artistic skills. They assist inmates to develop non-destructive modes of, com of communication and provide guidance in understanding the learning process, the creative process, the process of critical thinking, and the process of self-awareness. The current director is Jeffrey Green. He lives here in Brooklyn. I don't know if he's here with us this evening. Uh, he's wonderful, and he is the master planner of this initiative. In uh, July uh, of 1913, in the New Yorker, Rachel Louise Snyder, in her article, A Raised Hand, provided horrifying statistics. Women comprise roughly 85% of the victims of domestic violence. One in every four women is a victim of domestic violence at some point in her life. Of the 120,000 women incarcerated in this country, over 80% are survivors of domestic violence, rape, and other forms of abuse. The laws have rendered battered women criminals and have protected their batterers. And thanks to attorneys such as Joshua Safran and Nadia uh, Costa, the California laws today allow for incarcerated survivors of abuse to petition for their freedom. I would like to describe to you a little bit about crime after crime, and then we will watch the documentary. Crime After Crime was completed in 2011, and it's a documentary film directed and produced by Yohav Potash, premiered at Sundance Film Festival in 2011, has since earned 25 major awards, including the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award, the National Board of Review's Freedom of Expression Award, and the Hillman Prize for Broadcast Journalism. The film was a New York Times critic, critic's pick and earned the Henry Hampton Award for Excellence in Film and Digital Media presented by the Council on Foundations and the Pursuit of Justice Award presented by the California Women's Law Center. In May 2011, the film won the Golden Gate Award for documentary feature at the 54th Annual San Francisco International Film Festival. And it was later picked up by Oprah Winfrey's network for broadcast there. So we will watch the film and resume upon its completion. Thank you very much.
It gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you Josh Saffron. Josh. sit and chat for a minute. If you'd like to sit down, I just want to read to you that Josh Saffron is an author, an attorney, and he says, an occasional rabbi. Right. Very occasional. He is the author of the critically acclaimed new book, Free Spirit, Growing Up uh, on the Road and Off the Grid. Joshua is a nationally recognized champion for women's rights and a zealous advocate for survivors of domestic violence and the wrongfully imprisoned. For his work, he has received numerous awards, and his website is at www.jsaffron.com, and I thank you for joining us. How do you feel watching, watching a movie, that movie again? How many times have you seen it? I have seen that movie too many times, which is hard to believe, because I think it's an amazing movie, of course. It um, is. But I, my six-year-old says it best, which is, you seem to cry a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did you get involved with the making of the movie? Sure. How did Joe, uh, yeah, how did this yeah, happen? So the, the filmmaker is uh, one of my closest friends. We're sort of best men at I each see. other's wedding. Uh -huh. It was one of those deals. And when I was in law school, uh, he and I kind of uh, collaborated together on a short film called Minute Matrimony about a drive through wedding chapel. Um, sort of a commentary on today's fast food culture and what if love was the, the same, uh, dished up in the same way. And uh, he had me play the sort of, um, there were some strange parallels. I was the Jewish groom in a black Jewish wedding that involved a gospel choir that sang Hava Nagila and dancing <laughs> rabbis and that kind of thing. It was a comedy, obviously. Um, and it was a short film. And then when we finished that project, he said, well, what, let's do another movie. Let's do something else together. And I said, well, I'm I've graduated from law school now. I'm a real person. I have a mortgage, and you know I can't, you know I can't do that. But I'm doing this pro bono case. Maybe we could do a documentary about that. And we talked about it. And he said, you know, domestic violence is not an issue that people will go to a movie theater and sit through 90 minutes of. It's just too heavy. So thank you all for proving him wrong. Um, and quite frankly, the, your client isn't uh, innocent in the way that someone who's exonerated by DNA is innocent. And really, audiences want to know that the person they're rooting for is, you know, completely innocent, so to speak. And I said, okay, you know, okay, fair enough. Um, but he followed you for seven years, and you came out. <laughs> right. So story. we, so I kind of kept as a friend. Of course, I was updating him about where we were in the case. And finally, he was like, you know, this woman sounds really amazing. If you can get me into the prison, right? Um, let me kind of screen test her and see how how she shows up. And one of the secrets about California prisons is they're almost as hard to get into as they are to get out of. Um, so it took me about five months to figure out this trick of like, well, if I hire him as my legal videographer, then he's not the media, he's not a filmmaker, and if he happens to be swinging the camera around wildly while he's in the room, you know, what do they know? And um, So that's sort of what we did, and he met, and he sat down with Debbie, and I was sort of very poker-faced, because I'm, you know, uh, you know, supposed to be just playing my role as an attorney, and there's this guard that's kind of passing back and forth, uh, you know, at, at, on the side of the window there. And um, he he asked Debbie questions for about five hours on mm -hmm. um, that first day, and then when we and, and the main interview with her is from that actually it's from, from that, that first from day, that first day, the one where she looks sort of the youngest. You know, it's and, uh, it's really yeah. inter interesting, Joshua, because it's it's such a, a moving film, and there are a lot of tears in it, a lot of reason for a lot of tears in it. But there, the outrage mm -hmm. of it, in many ways, sometimes and occasionally during the course of the film, gets sort of subsumed by the emotion of it, by by, and certainly ultimately in the end of how how thrilled we are, like you know a great movie, that this woman is free. But here we are faced, still, with an outrage of justice. Uh, what happened to Cooley, and how often is this continuing to happen now? Yeah, so, <laughs> as you may gather, I, I had a hard time sleeping 
um, when this case sort of was over because it didn't feel over to me. Cooley was still out there and he of course was running for attorney general at that time on his law and order record. Um, and you know, I really wanted uh, Debbie's family to continue the litigation and continue sort of a formal exoneration yes. so we could sue him and bring them to task. And it was very hard for me to hear from them, we're done. This is a, this criminal injustice system is a system that has ruined our lives um, and we don't want to have anything to do with it ever yeah, again. And so I kept, you know, I kept saying, but the civil process is more civil than the criminal, you know, I don't, there's money in this for that, you know, and they just said, we don't care about the money. We don't care about anything. We, we're just done. Um, so it wasn't really until the film premiered at Sundance and I saw sort of the reaction uh, in the audience, which was, you know, like yours, I think, and um, although there was a fair amount of booing and hissing because the audiences there tend to be very kind of um, interactive. Well, they boo the evil right, they doers. Booed, right, they, <laughs> they booed the right people. They booed Cooley. <laughs> and then the next day, the American Bar Association kind of online journal um, ran an article, and the headline was, LADA featured in Sundance documentary, audiences boo hiss. Um, and at that point I was like, okay, you know, Debbie, all along I've been wanting her exoneration in the court of law, her exoneration and Cooley's condemnation are going to come in the court of public opinion. Right. And that's the way it's going to be. And her legacy will be assured and so will his. And, um, and what about the laws in the yeah. state of California and also in the rest of the world? I mean, in terms of, um, you know, women who are, who are domestic Right, uh, so, you know, so the, the, the battered women syndrome. I mean, yeah, um, the, the, there's good news and bad news. The good news is um, almost every state has uh, what is what was then called the battered woman's defense, now called an intimate partner battering and its effects defense, um, and that's good. So that means that women today at least should have the benefit of of provide telling their story. Um, the bad news is there's a generation of women like Debbie, or generations of women like Debbie who were incarcerated before these laws were passed, who don't get to reopen their cases. They don't. In 49 of 50 states. California remains the only state that actually has a, a, a formal avenue for these women to reopen their cases. Is there something that we can do about that? Th there is, and I am embarrassed that I don't have it uh, in front of me. It's a long, complicated name. There is a bill that's been introduced in the New York State uh, Legislature that's... Um, is Take it, note, it, everybody. Yeah, yes. It doesn't lend itself to an acronym. That's I can't all right. Remember, but, but Can you remember the whole thing? I, I can't. It's the. Um, it's like something like domestic violence survivors, uh, incarcerated domestic violence survivors justice act or something okay. to that effect. Does anybody here so. know about that act? All right, so everybody oh. can look it up and yes. Yeah, is that right? Right. Oh, minus the incarcerated. Okay. So, and that's that's something that we didn't have any. Our team didn't really have any role in, other than a little bit of cheerleading from the side, and we did, you know. Um, Who's sponsoring the legislation? Do you know? All right, so the question yeah. was, who's yeah. sponsoring the legislation? So we have a whole other discussion, which is why we're going to be continuing this series. So these are the kinds of things that we will put on our list that we need to provide for, for the public. But let's, That's, uh, for, for a minute, to get back to here. Yeah. So you're the only state still. So we're the only state. The good, because of Debbie's case, um, the California law has been amended twice, yeah. um, which is great. One, to sort of clean up the shenanigans from people like Cooley to give explicit instructions to prosecutors not to mess this up, which is great. And the second is um, the definition uh, or the, the opportunities for post-conviction remedies has been lowered. So it isn't, it's no longer just women who are convicted of murder, but now women who are basically convicted of any felony. Right. So a lot of times the classic is the w women are these getaway drivers, which means they're in the car, the husband or boyfriend or significant other goes into a liquor store and comes running out and says, drive, and she drives, and of course he's robbed the place or, you know. So uh, it's opened up wherever, wherever you can show that had um, the admission of this kind of evidence of battering uh, and and test, expert testimony really would would have undermined the confidence in the original conviction. These women can now present their case, and they're by and large, you know, grandmothers or you know, mothers women who've been in for 20, 30 years um, without really any hope of release. And I, I do want to give one great thing that we have been a bit of part of. Um, I think New Jersey may actually beat New York in this legislation, um, and there, there's a, a bill that's at least tentatively called Debbie's Law, mm -hmm. which we're working with um, 
Senate Majority Leader Loretta Weinberg in New Jersey, um, who's an awesome lady who describes herself as a Jewish grandmother, um, but she's of course the, the majority uh, whip of, um, the majority leader of the Democratic Party in the legislature. And uh, a 15 year old girl saw crime after crime at the Long Island Film Festival mm -hmm. and was so moved by it because she was 15 and Debbie was 15 at the time that she was uh, um, taken by Oliver Wilson. She organized a screening at like the JCC back in Teaneck and her parents, uh, along with this girl, Michaela is her name, they sort of pressured the local senator to come to the screening, who happened to be the Senate Majority Leader. And there was sort of like mob uh, psychology at this screening. I don't know if there are any legislators here today, but when the movie ended, someone got up and said, how come New Jersey doesn't have a law? And everyone looked to the state senator who <laughs> on the spot pledged to pass legislation. <laughs> oh, I have so, to call the mayor. <laughs> we'll have to get the governor. Do it. It's a, it's a great ambush opportunity. Um, we've done, I've flown out twice to meet with Loretta Weinberg and to meet with um, advocates in New Jersey. And I'm so really excited about So you could be available that, so. here. I'm your cheerleader. Yeah, let me know what I can do. All right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's very interesting. The film is now three years out. Yeah. And it doesn't feel the least bit dated, which is the good news and the bad news. It's yeah. mostly, in many ways, the bad news. Right. Um, but it has such an arc to it. The story has so much information about the injustices that this country is looking at in relationship to mass incarceration that I think it's a great primer, in a sense, if you, if you will. I mean, it really, it really gives you an overview and specifics of, of the horrors um, that can happen. And uh, the escalation of women in prison is astounding. And we have had earlier panels uh, that have discussed um, actually that uh, problem, that situation. I'm looking at this movie, and this is the second or third time I've seen it. And uh, I'm thinking about Debbie working uh, doing the work on the little computer things, I'm thinking, this is free labor. So how much is tied into prisoners who are working within the prisons and providing work for uh, companies? Not to mention, uh, who, who was it who said to me, you know, if you have how many uh, millions of people, is this two million people incarcerated, how many cans of tomatoes you need to prepare meals? What kind of business is incorporated in addition to the privatization of prisons? But um, with Debbie's working, th that was just part of her life there. That was a few hours during the day, right? Every day that she would work and get yeah. paid she, she actually seven dollars a week. She or was as well. No, she was actually beginning to approach. I, you know, I can't remember the numbers, but at the time, I remember it was she was the highest paid inmate or the highest paid class of inmate right. in the prison. And she, I mean, she was below minimum wage, but she was approaching it, which was actually astounding because many of the women got paid, you know, a quarter or an hour or whatever it was for right. the work that they were doing. Right. So it, it is. There was a a joint, the sort of joint venture program they call them in California. Of course, the problem. Many of, of Debbie's sisters, as she called them, her, her the right. women she was serving life with, are, are convinced that it was that uh, electronics manufacturing that exposed her to the toxic uh, materials right. that caused her lung cancer. Um, so the other staggering fact is that Debbie, um, she passed away, uh, you know, at uh, 50 and 49 is the average life expectancy of a woman inmate in California. Mm -hmm. So that kind of lets you understand the, the circumstances that we're dealing with, and there's the entire prison medical system in California is under a consent decree, and in 2005, a uh, district court judge found that uh, every six to seven, uh, uh, every day, uh, what, what is the statistic? Six to seven, every day, six to seven California inmates die needlessly. It was like one of Needlessly? His, needlessly. Just because of basic um, a lack of access to preventative health care, basic health care. They just don't have any infrastructure for that. Debbie was, was in that way. You know, she would have, her lung cancer would have been discovered years before when it was, um, so. What happened to Steve Cooley? Where is he now? So Steve Cooley, we felt we were sort of the feather on the scales that helped him lose that attorney general race. Um, he was pretty, um, he looked like a fool um, after he lost that race and, and we did everything we could to sort of help him lose that race. 
we had a, a special trailer that was just focused on Steve Cooley that we showed a lot during the, the election. Um, he, then, <laughs> he then was up for re-election as district attorney shortly thereafter. Oh, really? Um, and uh, in large part because of crime after crime, he was brought under a lot of pressure to not run again, and he did not run again. Um, so there's now um, district attorney Lacey is an African-American woman, a Democrat, is now right. the DA in LA, and Cooley has uh, sort of uh, slithered off into obscure obscurity, obscurity and retirement. Um, and are you still in touch with Debbie's family? I am, yes. In fact, I've been touring with um, Debbie's daughter, Natasha, the younger uh, mm -hmm. daughter, and, and Natasha and I have been doing a lot of the New Jersey trips, mm -hmm. and her other daughter, Takesha, is retiring from the Air Force this year, ah. having, uh, she's also a CPA, and, and is looking for, you know, at like 45, she's retiring, because she's done her time, you know, and, um, and Natasha's doing well, and they're, they're really um, sort of keeping up their mother's legacy, and and we see, you know, bits of her, bits of her in them, which is rewarding. One of the things that I felt was also um, ultimately successful in the in the film is talking about the diversity of women who are victims of uh, violence mm -hmm. and spousal abuse. And you mention your story yeah. in there. Do you want to say anything about that here? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the um, What's sort of not shown here is that when I first took Debbie's case, I didn't know exactly why I took the case. I kind of left at the opportunity. Um, I had some shameful and humiliating secrets in my past that I had never talked about with anyone, not even my mother. And um, once I took this case, I kind of naively went into this maximum security prison for women, me being who I am, and said, great, Debbie, tell me your story and I'll write it down and make it a public document and we'll get you out of here, you know? thinking that, you know, prison's bad, you're gonna do whatever it takes to get out, so not a problem, you know? And she wouldn't talk to me. She wouldn't say all of these things, and she basically was uncomfortable with me. And at a certain point, I had kind of a sit down with her, and I was like, look, you have to be honest, you have to be more forthcoming, et cetera, and she said, look, you know, the things that happened to me were at the hands of a man. You're a man, I don't even really know you, I'm just not comfortable talking with you about these things. Um, so I said, okay, and, and, and we kind of tried to break the ice. Well, I'll come visit you. We'll talk about other things, etc. So on one occasion I said, um, can you tell me anything that was sort of funny? I know that it was an awful situation that you were in, but was there something that s sticks out as being funny? And she had this memory and she said, yeah, you know, after he was done whipping me, he would whip me. And after he was done whipping me, he would put steak on my welts to bring down the swelling. And it was funny because he was both whipping me but also healing me. And I had a very visceral re memory um, to my own childhood at that moment, something that I had just not thought about and, and really never expressed. And I said, oh, I forgot about the raw meat. And in my mind, I was thinking, oh yeah, you know, how, do, how does one know that, that if you put raw meat on a wound, it brings down the swelling? It's not the kind of thing you would intuitively know. And yet everyone in, in these uh, family violence situations seems to know the trick. And she looked at me and she said, what, what do you mean, you know? And I said, well, in my household, it was funny, too, because we were vegetarians. We weren't allowed to have meat at all because to kill an animal was murder. But it was somehow okay for my stepfather to beat the hell out of my mother and then uh, put a stake on her face to bring down the welt on her, or, you know, the swelling on her cheek. And Debbie kind of gave me this look and sighed, which was, oh, now I see why you're here. Because <laughs> um, in her mind, she was very suspicious. Why are you, what, what's, who are you? Why are you here? And she was like, oh. And then she proceeded to sort of interview me in a way that made me jealous. I wish that I had those interviewing skills. Um, and she got this whole story out of me and something that I had never talked about. And I had this strange realization of, wow, I'm in this maximum security prison for women. There's the sniper tower, the barbed wire, the, the, the bars. And this is my first therapy, is with this convicted murderer um, interviewing me. And I, we really bonded over that, in part because you know, I was disclosing something right. that I never disclosed before, and right. we had all these commonalities. And um, after that, I think Debbie said later that she felt like we were a couple of war veterans, like rolling up our sleeves and comparing scars and right. trading stories. And through that process, she began telling me her story. Right. Um, and she really gave me the courage to come out and, and, and tell my story, which is part of what this book, Free Spirit, is about. And... At that point, I kind of realized, oh yeah, that's why I took this case. It wasn't 
you know, intuitive, you know, I didn't know consciously, but of course. And Debbie really felt um, in many ways, and you, you heard Nadia say this in the movie, that, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, domestic violence happens to, to poor black women in South Central LA, and that's, that's okay because it's over there or something. And Debbie really felt that, that my mother's story and my story were important because, uh, and, and Debbie couldn't believe it. She was like, your mother was the least likely victim of domestic violence, which is true. I mean, my mother uh, brought me up learning about herstory, not history, because yes. history was sexist. Um, literally, when my mother was asked, what's your favorite sports team or who are you rooting for in the big game? My mother would say, well, whichever team has the largest population of urban poor fans, because domestic violence rates will go down if the home team wins. You know, that was her level of consciousness about it. And here was a woman, and part of what my book is about is how does that woman, who, who was um, what she called sort of gay by choice, because politically she didn't want to associate with men, and she dated women, and then ultimately and unfortunately began to date a series of awful and more and more awful men. But um, So Debbie really encouraged me to sort of talk about that, and it was this strange moment for me where I had to shift from my line now is I say, like, yes, my, my most shameful and humiliating experiences are now my defining characteristics, you know. And that's was, was that healing for you? It was incredibly healing. Has it healing. been in writing your book and telling your story? It has been. It was incredibly scary. Um, yeah. The San Francisco Chronicle wanted to do a profile on Nadia and I, uh, the legal team, sort of what motivated us. And I think they had some sense of what may have motivated us. And we both said, absolutely not. We're not doing this, this profile. And Debbie scolded us and was like, you know, you told me that I need to tell my story and it would be healing and help to end the cycle of violence and it's not my fault and I had nothing to be ashamed of and, you know, how come you, could, you can't tell your story? Um, so when that article came out, I had this long night. We worked in the, the law firm that you saw with these beautiful white carpets and, you know, my secretary who was always offering to do my dry cleaning, even though I wasn't exactly sure what dry cleaning was because I grew up without anything like that. But um, I had this long night of like, oh no, I'm going to walk in tomorrow as this damaged goods, crazy person who like lived through this crazy hell and then had all these homicidal uh, response of wanting to kill my stepfather. And, you know, I had talked about all of that to, to the newspaper. And I was sort of shocked when I came. There was one partner who I worked with who basically wouldn't give me any work after that and was like, he was just, it was too much for him. He was like, I'm too much, just too much, you know. Um, but I was really pleased that um, both my fellow attorneys and then also clients uh, immediately contact, oh, you're so brave, thank you for telling the story. And then that amazing, when you begin to see that statistic that it's one in four women, suddenly everyone's like, oh yeah, you know, this happened to my sister, or oh, this happened to me, or I had something similar. All these people are coming out of the woodwork. Well, so. they have to come out of the woodwork, but it shouldn't be, oh, yeah, well, it happened too. I mean, that, that's part of what our challenge is here, and I think, and part of why uh, I wanted for the Sackler Center to do this series is to raise awareness for people who uh, really are not aware or are, are somehow have it off their radar. It's not part of their life or uh, do not work in these areas. Uh, but most of this country does not realize that we are in a mass incarceration human crisis here, which has been planned and executed. Um, and I think we're possibly beginning to see a, a, a change, a turn. It's front, a lot of front page stories right now about here in New York about Rikers Island, one thing and the other. So I think that it probably would be helpful for women to support women I guess by telling their stories or sons and daughters also to tell stories of their experiences. I think it's also important from a cultural point of view that we don't start stereotyping or making assumptions or continuing assumptions or creating assumptions. Uh, I think it's hard enough for people coming out of a prison system to somehow uh, manage to be reincorporated and incorporate themselves back in, and that's a whole other evening uh, to discuss, but which we won't do now. But there is a lot. I thank you all for coming. Joshua, thank you for, he flew in from the West Coast to be with us this evening. This is really an opportunity for us. And uh, before you leave, um, there are two things. Um, 
One is that I want to let you know that Anita Hill is going to be the 2014 Sacker Center First awardee this year, and that will be on June 5th, so I hope you all will join us. And also that Joshua has brought books with him. This is an opportunity for all of you to come up on stage to pose your personal questions or not so personal questions to Josh, any questions you have, and perhaps buy a book and have him sign it for you. And I thank you. Oh, yes, there's somebody here. Senator Ruth Hassel Thompson is sponsoring the bill for New York State. Great. Thank you for that information and thank you all for coming this evening. Do join us on stage, please.